theorized that his daughter spent more time on her cell phone than his son. He randomly selected 27 calls made by his son and 25 calls made by his daughter from his past phone records. His son's calls had an average length of 23 and a half minutes with a variance of 28 minutes. His daughter's calls had an average length of 36.1 minutes with a variance of 35 minutes. Find the 99% confidence interval for the true mean difference between the length of calls made by his son and his daughter. Assume equal variances. Is there a significant difference? So first thing I want to recognize here is that we have a couple of things that indicate this is a T interval. The first thing is they talk about this assume equal variance stuff, right? So that's usually only discussed when we have a smaller sample size. And you look at these two sample sizes, 27 calls, 25 calls, right? Made by his daughter from the past phone records. So the sample sizes are small and the fact that they're mentioning this equal variances tells us that it's a T test uh, or a T interval, sorry. So what we want to do is construct the four steps of a confidence interval. And the first thing we want to do is to write down all the information. That'd be the simplest thing. So let's start with um, the son's information and then we'll look at the daughter's information, right? Okay, so for the son, we have a sample size of 27. We have a sample mean length of time for the calls of 23 and a half. We have a standard deviation, or sorry, variance actually they say, right? Variance, they say with a variance of. So we're gonna write that as S squared to reflect that it's the variance of 28 minutes, right? And then for the daughters, we'll have N is equal to 25. The X bar for her calls were 36.1. The standard deviation, or sorry, the variance again, variance squared is 35. Okay, and then we're told that the confidence level is 0.99 and of course that makes the alpha 0.01 right all right so we have that information the next step after collecting the data is to find our table value right so the next thing we're going to do is to try to look up our t alpha divided by 2 value right so t alpha divided by 2 so this t alpha divided by 2 value is going to be a little different from what we've done in the past so we have to know its degrees of freedom. So what we have to remember for this guy is that its degrees of freedom is n1 plus n2 minus 2. So the degrees of freedom is not as simple as just n minus 1, you know, because there's two sample sizes. So we actually have the sum of the two degrees of freedoms you would expect. n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. So together that's n1 plus n2 minus 2. All right, so let's go use that, or let's first determine what that is before we go to the table, and then we'll use that to look up the value we need. So first of all, alpha is 0.01, so when you divide it by 2, it's going to be, of course, alpha over 2, right? So what we need to go to the table with is we're going to go to the table with 27 plus 25 minus 2. If you work that out, that's going to be 50, right? Because we took 2 away from 27, you'd have 25, and then 25 and 25 would give you 50. And then the alpha divided by 2, in this case, that's going to be 0 0.005. So we're going to go to our table, look up 50 degrees of freedom with 0 0.005 as the alpha in one tail, go down to that 50 degrees of freedom and find our t table value. So let's go to the t table now and look that up. Okay, so we're looking for 0 0.005 in one tail, and we're going all the way down to 50 degrees of freedom. So let's see where that is on the table. Okay, so it looks like 50 degrees of freedom is there, and that's 2.678. Okay, so we found the answer 2.678 as our t value. Okay, so now that we have our critical t value, the next step is going to be to plug that into our margin of error formula. But in order to do the margin of error formula, we're going to have to uh, remember a complicated um, standard error formula for our variables here. So let's go ahead and write out the formula for margin of error, and then we'll go ahead and start filling it in. So the first thing we're going to do is have the table value, t alpha divided by 2. And then we'll have this square root. And then the square root has a special form. It basically, what we're going to have is we're going to have s p squared over n1 plus s p squared over n2. And the reason why we're using this s p value is that's the pooled estimator for the standard uh, deviation for the variables here. So what we're going to do is say that um, we're using a pooled estimator because we believe that the population variances are assumed to be equal. That's what the problem told us. It said assume the population variances are equal. Whenever you assume they're equal, you use SP, the pooled estimate. All right. 
So here's what we're going to do then. We have to go stop here and fill in that pooled estimate formula. That way we know what it is so we can plug it into our formula, right? It's not a matter of simply dragging these S's over here and using them. We can't do that. We have to actually use the pooled estimate formula. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out what that is separately and then we'll come back and put it into our formula. So SP squared is defined as, it's basically a weighted estimator of the um, variances that were given in the problem. So we'll have N1 minus 1 times S1 squared plus N2 minus 1 times S2 squared. And then we divide all of that by that uh, degrees of freedom we had, which is N1 plus N2 minus 2. Okay, so it's basically a weighted average of the variances that we were given. Now from there, let's plug in our numbers. We'll have 26 here for the first parentheses. This quantity, S squared, for the first population, that's given to us. S squared is 28, right? So we don't have to square it because it's already squared here, right? Then we'll add that to uh, N2 minus 1, that'll give us 24. And then times this S2 squared, but that's the same as our S squared value here, or 35. And then finally, under all of that, you'll divide by that same 50, which is our degrees of freedom. Okay, so let's work that out with our calculators and see what that gives us. So we'll have 26 times 28 plus 24 times 35. And then that gives us 1,568, which we will divide by 50 to get 31.36. 31.36. Okay, so that'll be 31.36. All right, now once we have that, we'll plug that into our margin of error formula to end up with the error formula is equal to 2.678 times 31.36 divided by 27 plus 31.36 divided by 25, right? These are the sample sizes, N1, N2. All right, so we divided that. Let's see what that gives us in the calculator. So we'll have 2.678 times the square root of so 2.678 times the square root of 31.36 divided by 27 plus 31.36 divided by 25. Close up the parentheses and you get 4.16. 4.16. So I'm not going to round it off that far. I'm going to do 4.16. Two, four, dot, 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 and I'm actually going to store that in my calculator. So I will take that and hit the store key and store it in a variable x. Okay, so now it's stored in my calculator. I can use it for the next and final step of the problem. All right, so the last step of the problem, the last thing we have to do is to take our sample means and subtract them, right? And then we're going to subtract this error from that quantity. Then we'll do the sample mean subtracted and add that error to it. So this is the famous final step of confidence intervals that we've done a bunch of times. So I'm actually going to get a new sheet of paper out to do it. And that way we can finish the problem like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is actually uh, just remove this other one from underneath here. So we have this. I'll actually work this out here, and I'll just write down the values that we've found thus far that are important to us. All right, so if you remember, we had x for the sun, x bar for the sun, to be equal to 23 and a half. And we had x bar for the daughter equal to 36.1. Okay, now from there, we're going to take our interval and do x bar for the son minus x bar for the daughter minus the error we just found. Then comma x bar for the son minus x bar for the daughter plus the error that we found. All right, so what is the difference between those x bars, right? What is the difference between them? So we have 23.5 minus 36.1. When you do that, you get negative 12.6. So we'll have negative 12.6 minus our error. Now if you remember what our error was, it was basically you know 4.16 or so, right? So 4.16 dot dot dot. And then we'll have negative 12.6 plus that 4.16 dot dot dot, right? And so the final result that we're going to get when we do that, we'll work it out in our calculator, it'll be negative 12.6 minus 
minus the error. I store that as a variable, so I'm going to go ahead and just enter it like that. And I get negative 16.8 minutes, right? So negative 16.8 minutes up until, if I do that same minus 12.6 plus my error, all right, I will get negative 8.44, or in other words, just 8.4. Okay, so that's it. I have negative 16.8 and negative 8.4 minutes. So now we have to interpret that interval, right? So remember, what we're saying is that we think the true difference between the time that the boy spends on the phone and the time that the girl spends on the phone is between negative 16.8 minutes and negative 8.4 minutes. And what that means essentially is that since we did the subtraction, remember we did the subtraction basically son minus daughter, because that was the way we did the subtraction, if her time was longer than his time, we get a negative difference. And the fact that this whole interval is negative, it means we get a statistically significant negative difference, which essentially means that it looks like the daughter does in fact spend more time on the phone than the boy. So if they ask us that question at the end of the problem that they did, which is, is there a significant difference? So when we look back at the problem here, you see they asked, is there a significant difference between their time spent on the phone? The answer we're going to say is yes, there is a significant difference. So we'll say yes, there is a significant difference. And basically we're saying because of the interval that we're 99% um, confident that the true difference between the time spent on the phone is somewhere between 8.4 minutes and 16.8 minutes. And of course that means that essentially um, the minimum time that the daughter spends more on the phone than the, than the son is 8.4 minutes. The minimum average time and 16.8 minutes is kind of the maximum that we expect the true population difference to be between. So we're somewhere between 8.4 and 16.8 minutes of time more that the daughter spends on the phone than the son.